Well, good morning. Turning your Bibles this morning to Genesis 29. We ended last week in Genesis 29:30. We'll begin where we left off this week. It's interesting. I'm ready for for Pastor Mark to say, "You may be seated," and uh, so you may be seated if you're standing at home. In 1 John 5:21, John writes, "Little children, keep yourself." from idols, idolatry. That's an interesting topic for me to begin a sermon with in the year 2020. Think about it. Not too many of us burn incense in little bronze statues in our living rooms. Idolatry might have been a problem in the past or maybe even in some other cultures, but it's really not much of an issue for us now. Or is it? Most of us think about idolatry in in terms of little wooden statues, but idolatry in its many forms actually begins in our hearts. A form of idolatry that we can relate to is when we desire or we want something so bad that we'll put aside our principles and the things that we know are right to do in order to get things or to possess something. This morning in our, in our reading in Genesis 29 and most of 30, we'll see the kind of idolatry that many Christians fall into. Think of the things that are good, that we all need, but we tend to love too much or want at all costs. Think of the things that you just feel like you can't live without. We've come this morning to a text that's really difficult to wrestle with, but it's also very simple in its lesson. How do we get here? Well, Jacob has married two women, Leah and Rachel. One is greatly loved and the other, well, not so much. What terrible heart trouble and strife this brings. And it's all set up in chapter 29, verse 30, when we read, so Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. And so where there ought to be great joy, we'll see this morning, there turns out, it turns out to be great trouble. We have an unloved wife, blessed by God. Read with me in 29, verses 31 to 35. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son. She conceived again and called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name shall be called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Through this paragraph, we began to see Leah's dependence on God. She acknowledges that each son that she bears comes from God. Her deep faith in God who loves her and who blesses her causes her to walk in obedient worship. She responds to God as the giver of her blessings. He has taken notice of her, verse 32. He has heard her, verse 33. And so verse 35, we read that now she will praise him. We're encouraged then to be intentional about our dependence on God. There's a there's a kind of dependence that sometimes is forced upon us when God gives us a swift kick in the pants. Too many Christians are quietly and simply self-reliant, depending completely on themselves. 
And maybe this is you. Years ago, I was in a, in a class somewhere for work, and the teacher called these things significant emotional events. We might call them catastrophes or things that shake us up. It may take a significant emotional event to shake our self-confidence and our self-reliance. We can look so spiritual, can't we? Until times where we just fall apart and we cry out in private and we cry out to God even in public dependence. But it is so much better for us to recognize what's been true all along. Self-reliance is a mirage, it's, it's a myth, it's, a, it's an illusion. God desires and intends for us to be self-consciously dependent on him at all times. This is the function of praying without ceasing. It's a continual prayer, it's a heart that is dependent on God that sends up sentences of prayer for grace and for mercy, for wisdom, for insight, and sometimes even for love, praise, and adoration to God. You and I ought to love like this. It ought to thrill your heart to be utterly dependent on God and to say so all the time. Then we'll know that God takes notice and has given us grace and is worthy of our praise. And so we see in this, in this text so far progression of sons at the human level, this is a little bit astonishing because we have Jacob's wife. It's his first wife. She loves him dearly and she presents herself to him. And we can wonder from our perspective, what, what about the whys and the hows of this intimacy from a man who does not love her back? Yet every year for four years, she produces a son. The family the family squabbling here turns into the beginning of the tribal lineage of Israel. Yet God is pleased to bring into existence through all this turmoil the first of his chosen people. From the progression of the first four sons of Leah come the prominent tribes of Israel. She brings forth Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Later on, Levi will be chosen as the tribe set aside as priests unto God. Judah will become the royal tribe from which Israel's kings will descend and whose great end will be Jesus Christ, our king. We see in, in this great expressions of her pain. She is unloved and maybe even hated based on verse 31. She has become a wife through deceit. She was not the one who was loved. She was not the one who was longed after. She was not the one who was labored for. She was the surprise the morning after. It's almost certain that she had little or no choice in this matter. She was the eldest and she must obey her father in this, in this deceit. Now she is in a marriage where her husband does not love her and her sister is the apple of his eye. Listen to her longing in the way that she names her sons. Reuben, she's experiencing affliction and longs for her husband's love. Simeon, she's experiencing hatred and rejection, yet she knows God cares. Levi, She's experiencing loneliness and alienation and longs for her husband to be attached to her. And Judah, now there's no complaint with Judah. Upon the birth of the son from whom the future kings will come, there is nothing but praise from her lips. And it would be easy to wonder whether or not her desire to be loved by her husband has become an inordinate desire or an idol. I don't see that yet in this text. Maybe she just wanted to be treasured. She just wanted to, to have her husband see her value and treasure her and love her and be attached to her. But it was not to be. This is often the way it is with us. You have a real and legitimate desire for what God commands someone else to give you. 
Maybe it's the love and affection due a spouse. Maybe it's the rightful recognition from your boss or some other person over authority, over you, over, or in authority over you. But then they withhold that love or they withhold that recognition. How do you respond? Will you crave it to the point where you will sin to get it? Or you sin when you don't get it? Will you be content to continue to desire it, but stay submitted to the sweet and the good providence of God? Now this is where our Christ-centered trajectory must be wise and it must be biblical. And Leah shows us this. She shows us how God blesses us even when we are despised and even when we are rejected by people who ought to love us. Maslow and Dr. Phil are wrong. We do not have a basic need to be loved. We have a desire to be loved, and for many it becomes a craving. But we have a responsibility to love others, to love God, and to love our neighbors as we actually do love ourselves. Leah shows us how to be God-dependent when rightly longing for the kindness and for the love of others. And here is the lesson for the nation of Israel and for all of God's people. We will often be hated and we will often be despised, sometimes by people who ought to care for us. We can't respond with bitterness and anger on the one hand, or self-pity and depression on the other hand. And while it doesn't always work this way, we may even experience from God unmeasured blessing through this time. Yes, Jesus came to his own people, and they rejected him, despised him, and finally crucified him. But praise God for the progression of sons and daughters that have come from the death and resurrection of our Lord. Even though his obedience was painful and sad and hard. Well, we come to chapter 30. In the first 18 verses, we see how often it's hard when aggravating circumstances come upon us. So here Leah is not only loved by her husband, she's envied and taunted and finally humiliated by her sister. And floundering through all this mess is the weak and inept Jacob whose foolish love for Rachel binds him to her and blinds him to Leah. Look with me starting in verse 1 of chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and he said, Am I in the place of God? Who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, Here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf that even I may have children through her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But Leah said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes as well? 
Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Every time I read this text, from my heart comes the phrase, are you kidding me? And I have to step back and understand God's providential care in this matter. How envy and jealousy rules Rachel's heart. She has the love and devotion of her husband and her sister does not, yet she is jealous of her sister's children. What place will they have? For without sons, her future is totally insecure. Jacob will pass on the complete inheritance to Leah's sons. Rachel will get nothing. What will she have? Her sister has it all. What folly, what foolishness envy is. Its gaze on what God has given others blinds us sometimes to what God has given us. We sometimes call that living in what if land. Rachel stands in stark contrast to her sister. Her desires become demands. You have to love this. this I, I, hear, I hear my three-year-old's tantrum in this in her voice. Give me children or I die. What? She's going to threaten him? What's he supposed to do about it? Any thinking person understands Jacob is not the problem because he has sons with Leah already. Rachel is barren and Leah is blessed by God and Jacob knows all this. He is not God nor is he in God's place. He cannot cause what only God causes. And in his response is a rebuke to Rachel as well. God has withheld the fruit of her womb, so what is he supposed to do about it? And so Rachel proposes the family old solution. Take my handmaid and have children with her. The phrase on my behalf literally in the Hebrew reads on my knees. When the surrogate would give birth while well, actually sitting on the knees of the of the of the wife, it was considered that the surrogate was providing a child for the wife. Or sometimes if the surrogate was not sitting on the wife's knees, it was, the baby would go immediately to the wife's knees as she sat. And so that symbolized the child was provided. And so Jacob fathers two boys, Dan and Naphtali, by Rachel's handmaid. And listen to the triumph in her voice. She has competed with her sister and now she has prevailed. She is such a fool. How can two boys fathered by her handmaid possibly be a triumph over her sister who has four natural born children? And contrast the name and the statements that she makes about her sons with those of Leah and her sons. In Dan, she sees the reversal of the judgment of God. And in Naphtali, she has wrestled and overcome her sister. And in neither one of these is there any real dependence on God. Nor there is, any, is there any sense of these children being presented as a gift to her husband by God. She has received God's disfavor and by her own hand, in her own mind, has now scored points against her sister. She is not going to be outdone by her sister. If only she had been as content to wait on God for her rightful place over her sister as she was to wait 14 years for her husband's heart. How many of you would come to the place that you would be glad in the favor of God even if what you sought after and loved never came to pass in a relationship that you desired or a relationship that you prized?
And so we see the ridiculousness continue in the trading of favors. Moses now writes about the pettiness and the pointlessness of their strife. And it's hard for us to understand this culturally because we live in monogamous marriages. And so to understand what's going on here is a bit of a a difficulty for us. And it's kind of mind-boggling. So during the harvest... Leah's son Reuben finds these mandrakes. Mandrakes are a plant that was considered to be a fertility drug. In Song of Solomon, it was a plant that would enhance intimacy. And so many thought it would help a barren woman conceive. So begins this bizarre negotiation. Rachel wanted some of the mandrakes to help her infertility. Leah refuses. Her bitterness against Rachel is evident. You took my husband, and now I'm supposed to help you have children with him? And so Rachel responds by offering a trade. Several nights with Jacob in return for the mandrakes. And I think this confirms the implication earlier in the text where Leah quit having children because Leah was no longer intimate with her husband. And so Leah agrees to the trade, and it seems that now her heart has begun to bow to an idol, the idol of her husband's affection and her husband's attention. So she meets Jacob on the way home from the harvest, and and again, mind-boggling for me, you're mine tonight, I've hired you, which is a dig at Jacob, paying by giving you my son's mandrakes, which is a dig at Rachel and her barrenness. And so Jacob and and Leah are intimate and she conceives another son. God has dealt with her. God has given her her due wages for doubting him and for giving Jacob her handmaiding. And so Issachar is born and named. And this is just sorted. But imagine this. Here, imagine this is Israel hearing this years later from Moses. Here is Israel with all their national prejudice and their tribal pride against other nations hearing the inspired account of the struggle and the trouble by which they became a people. They should certainly be humbled. They should be thankful that God designs the sad state of human affairs and relations, yet brings his own goodness and good purposes. And as I study this again, and I fight back my condemnation, I realize that we are not far from this. We so rely on our ingenuity and on our strategies to get what we want. But how much better to trust and depend and to wait on God What an encouragement to know that even when we don't, God is still at work. God is still working to accomplish what he desires and what he designs. Verse 19. And Leah conceived again, and she bore a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. God blesses Leah with a gift of his last son. Zebulun is born. The sixth son, a great gift from God. The one endowment implies not only a great and unexpected gift from God, but a rich blessing that can be passed on to others. Now, finally, she'll be honored and respected and loved by her husband. This is now six sons she has borne him. Maybe now he'll see her worth. Maybe now he'll hold her up in honor. Six sons of his own she has blessed him with. Now he'll look at her with affection and honor. Or will he despise her still? And then she bears a daughter, Dinah, 
who only really appears here in this story as a footnote. But in verse 22, we see that God has lifted Rachel's reproach. He takes notice of her and he moves on her behalf. It is God's mercy, not mandrakes and ingenuity and handmaidens, which will make the barren ones rejoice as the mother of children. God had closed her womb, and God opens her womb. For the first time in this text, Rachel acknowledges with a true heart that God has taken her reproach away by giving her these sons. And she names this final son Joseph. His son means, may he add. But in Hebrew, it's, it's, a, it's almost a play on words. It sounds like be taken away. The irony of his naming and the history of his life, well, we're going to see that in the next few weeks. So, how do you respond when someone's disobedience leaves you without? We can react or we can respond. You can't demand what ought to be freely given first. You can ask and you ought to hope and you ought to pray much. And you seek counsel to bear it well. You learn to be content by seeking your satisfaction in God alone. But your desires should never become demands. Second, you ought not deny what God has graciously commanded. Jacob, was, Jacob withheld what was commanded him to give. The affection and the attention due his wife. It does not matter how the relationship began. It is still his responsibility to, responsibility to respond to God and reflect God's love toward her. We love by grace whom we ought to love. Thirdly, you must not allow even the good from God to be craved so much that you will sin to get it or sin when you don't have it. Yes, there are wrong desires. But I find that most of our problem with idols are good desires, legitimate desires, that we tend to begin to worship. So my challenge to you this morning is simply this. And to most of you, this text sounds strange, but to all of us, it should ring, ring true. Join with me as we search our hearts and cry out to God as we confess our sin and long to be holy before our great king. We must be satisfied. We must submit. We must be content. And our hearts must be conquered by our Lord, Jesus Christ. Father, you are an incredible God. You are so far greater than we can understand. We read these things and we are confused and perplexed, much like the psalmist. But we trust that you are working through it and we see you working through even our our foibles, our errors, and even our sin. And so we bow before your throne this morning, praising you, loving you, with an attitude of thanksgiving in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.